All right, today we're going to cover the physics paper two multiple choice. This is the extended paper, and that's for May June 2016. The code is 0625 slash 21, and this is the Cambridge International Examination. Now, shall we begin? Question one. The diagram shows an enlarged drawing at the end of a metre rule. It's being used to, leisure, uh, to measure the length of a small feather. So what is the length of the feather? Okay, let's see. It begins at 10 millimetres and it goes all the way up to 29 millimetres. So the length will be 29 minus 10 and millimetres and of course that's 19 millimetres, which is option A. Two. The speed time graph shown is for a car moving in a straight line. What is the acceleration of the car when the time is 40 seconds? Right. And again, this is one of those situations where they, they use speed and velocity interchangeably. Are they? No. But we've got a graph here and we can interpret it in a certain way if we take it as speed to be velocity. So let's look at what happens. At any point, the gradient of the line gives us the acceleration. Change in speed over change in time. So the gradient of the line gives us the acceleration. Here, of course, it's positive. Over here, it would be negative, a negative acceleration. All right. So at some point here, it goes from positive to negative. And that happens at this point here where the gradient is flat. And that happens at t equals 40 seconds, which is what we're being asked about. Here, at this point, the gradient is flat. The acceleration is zero, just per second squared. So that's answer A. Question three, two runners take part in a race. The graph shows how the speed of each runner changes with time. And what does the graph show about the runners at time t? All right, let's look at our options. Both runners are moving at the same speed. Runner one has zero acceleration. Runner one is overtaking runner two. And runner two is slowing down. Let's just run through them and explain why it isn't certain things. Zero acceleration. Both of them have increasing speed. So it isn't that one. Runner 1 is overtaking runner 2. That will happen when they've travelled the same distance, when the area under the graphs is the same. And here, the area is not the same. How do we know that? Well, look, because this triangle, which is how far runner 1 has travelled, is smaller than the triangle plus a bit more over here. OK, and runner 2 is slowing down. Well, CB, both of them are speeding up. As long as the speed as long as we're moving that way up the graph, the speed is increasing. So just to be clear, what's actually happening here, they're at the same point in the speed time graph. If we draw a line across here, they're both traveling at the same speed. That's option A. Four, a satellite orbits the Earth above the atmosphere at a constant speed. The diagram shows a satellite at one point in its circular orbit around the Earth. Which labelled arrow shows the direction of the resultant force on the satellite at the position shown? Okay, so let's be clear about this. Let's be clear about what happens. When something is travelling in a circle, there is, if it's travelling in a circle, there we go, beautiful circle, it has an acceleration towards the centre. It has an acceleration towards the centre and therefore it has a force towards the centre. So that's option D. If it was B, then the satellite would be getting further away from planet Earth. If it was C, again, the satellite would be speeding up and the orbit would be getting larger. If it was A, then the satellite would be slowing down. The direction of motion is given here. The satellite would slow down and it would decay and explode. There we go. All right. So the answer is option D. Five. A cup contains hot liquid. Some of the liquid evaporates. 
what happens to the mass and what happens to the weight of the liquid in the cup. Okay, well, let's quickly draw this out. We have liquid in a cup, some of it evaporates, which means we have less liquid in the cup. So the weight's going to decrease and the mass will also decrease. Option A. Question six. The diagram shows three uniform beams, P, Q and R, each pivoted at the centre. The two forces acting on each beam are also shown. OK, so we've got a force on the left and the right of the centre for each of the beams. And the question is, which beams rotate clockwise? So each force is going to create a moment. One of the moments will push down in this direction, and the other one will push down in that direction. This one would be anti-clockwise and this one would be clockwise because it's in the same direction as the clock hands move. So the question is, which one of these beams, P, Q and R, pushes down more in this way than it does in the other? So we're looking for the clockwise moment to be bigger than the anti-clockwise moment. So let's just look at that and calculate it out. So this is the anti-clockwise moment, and moment equals force times perpendicular distance from the pivot, or force times distance from the pivot. So this is going to be 4 newtons times 2 metres, which is 8 newton metres. The one on this side, the clockwise moment, is going to be 4 newtons times 1 metre, which is 4 newton metres. And 8 newton metres is bigger, which means that P will not rotate clockwise. It's obviously down in the bottom here. That's our key point, which, which beams rotate clockwise. All right, so not P. P rotates anti-clockwise. Let's look at Q. And again, we'll examine both sides. So for our force times distance from pivot, we have two newtons multiplied by four meters, which is eight newton meters. And on the right hand side, we have five newtons times two meters, which equals 10 newton meters. As this one's the biggest, it's gonna go clockwise. There we go, so Q, yes, that goes clockwise. So let's look at R. We have four times distance from pivot, 1.5 newtons times two meters will give us three newton meters. And on the other side, we have one newton times four meters, which is four newton meters. So again, this one's a winner. This is a clockwise moment. So R, there we go. So both Q and R rotate the beam clockwise. So Q and R, the answer is C. Seven, an object of mass 50 kilograms accelerates from a velocity of two meters per second to a velocity of 10 meters per second in the same direction. What is the impulse provided to cause this acceleration? Well, the impulse is equal to the change of momentum. So our change of momentum is just going to be 10 meters per second divided by 50 kilograms, mass times velocity, minus 50. the initial mass and velocity. That's 2 meters per second and still 50 kilograms. And the difference between those two is 400 newton seconds. And the answer is B. Eight, a scalar quantity has, ooh, let's pause briefly and review that. A scalar quantity has magnitude and no direction. A vector quantity has both magnitude and direction. So we're being asked about scalar quantities, so we have magnitude and no direction. The answer is C. Nine, energy is released in some nuclear reactions. Which nuclear reaction takes place in a nuclear power station and which nuclear reaction takes place in the sun? All right, nuclear reactions. In a nuclear power station, we expect to see fission. That's where large nuclei are broken in, into smaller pieces and energy is released. In the sun, we take small nuclei and we fuse them together. There we go. So sun is fusion, 
these are possible answers then. And nuclear power station should be fission. There we go, the answer is B. Number 10. A lorry of mass 400 kilograms is travelling at a speed of 4 meters per second. A car has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. The kinetic energy of the car is equal to the kinetic energy of the lorry. What is the speed of the car? Ooh, tricky little question. Let's look at that. Kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared. So let's begin with the lorry. One half times 4,000 times 4.0 meters per second squared. There we are. And that will give us a value of 32,000 joules. So we know kinetic energy of the car is equal to the kinetic energy of the lorry. What that means is because we know the mass of the car, we can work it out. One half times the mass of the car, 1,000 kilograms, times V squared is 32,000 joules. So let's take that V squared. We rearrange those. V squared then equals... 64, and units of this will be meters squared seconds negative 2, that doesn't actually matter. We take the square root of both sides here, and that gives me V equals 8 meters seconds minus 1. The answer is C. Question 11. A force acts on an object and causes the object to move a certain distance, in the same direction as a force. Which row represents a situation in which the largest amount of work is done on the object by the force? All right, well, what do we know about this? We know that work done is force times distance moved in the direction of the force. All right, so here we've got two times 40. That's going to give us 80 joules. That's two times 40, just to show where it's coming from. And here, this would be two times 10, which would give me 20 joules. Here, this would be six times 20, which would give me 120 joules. And here, let's be 1 times 100, which will give me 100 joules. And we have a winner. We want the biggest one. The answer is C. Question number 12. A diver underwater uses breathing apparatus at a depth where the pressure is 1.25 times 10 to the 5 pascals. A bubble of gas breathed out by the diver has a volume of 20 centimetres cubed when it's released. The bubble moves upwards to the surface of the water. At the surface of the water, the atmospheric pressure is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The temperature of the water is the same at all depths. What is the volume of this bubble when it reaches the surface? All right. Nice straightforward one, this. As long as we remember our equation, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. We want to find our volume uh, when it reaches the surface, V2. Well, V2 is just going to be P1, V1 divided by V2. So that is then uh, P1 is 1.25 times 10 to the power of 5 pascals multiplied by ooh, 20 centimeters cubed divided by the pressure on the surface, which is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And that will give us a value, that's for V2. So V2 gives us a value of 25 centimetres cubed. There we go. That is answer D. Question 13. The diagram shows a simple mercury barometer. The atmospheric pressure increases, which distance increases? All right, so before worrying too much about this, what I'm going to do is just look at what happens. When atmospheric pressure increases, X will get pushed further down. W will get pushed further up. So W increases, X decreases, and Y and Z all remain the same. All right, so which distance increases? V and W actually decreases. W and Y, well, they will get further apart. X and Y 
will get closer together. X and Z will also get closer together. So the answer there is B. Question 14. Which statement about evaporation is correct? Well, quickly review what evaporation is. Evaporation is for the top. Some of the molecules at the top of the water are have enough energy to escape because they've got more than the average kinetic energy. The rest of the water gets a little bit colder. So, A, evaporation causes the temperature of the remaining liquid to decrease. Well, that's absolutely true. B, evaporation does not occur from cold liquid near its freezing point. No, not true. C, evaporation does not occur from a dense liquid such as mercury. It occurs from all liquids. And D, evaporation occurs from all part of a liquid. Nope, only the surface. And that is answer A. 15. A beaker contains 0.5 kilograms of water at a temperature of 3 degrees Celsius. The beaker is heated and the internal energy of the water increases by 21 kilojoules. All right, underline that 0.5 kilograms as well. The specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. What is the temperature of the water after it has been heated? Right, first things first. We need our equation that deals with uh, heating and specific heat capacity when we're dealing with uh, change in temperature. So, the energy required was mc delta t. You might remember it's delta theta. It's absolutely fine either way. Energy is mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. And I want to find the change in temperature. All right, so E M C delta T. You can just use a triangle because these are all just multiplied through. I want change in temperature, so I just cover it over. And that gives me the equation that I need to use. So change in temperature equals E over MC. So that's then going to give me the energy in 21,000 joules divided by mass, not 0.5 kilograms, multiplied by the specific capacity 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. There we go. All right, and if I calculate that through, I get a value of 10 degrees Celsius. But this 10 degrees Celsius is the change in temperature. The final temperature will be the initial temperature plus the change in temperature. So that's going to be 3 degrees Celsius plus 10 degrees Celsius gives me 13 degrees Celsius and the answer is C. There we go. Let's move on to 16. 16. A substance loses thermal energy to the surroundings at a steady rate. The graph shows how the temperature of the substance changes with time. All right, let's look at this. And I'm just going to label this before I even look at the question. So this is gas cooling. This would be gas changing to liquid. This would be liquid cooling. And this would be liquid changing to solid. Now, it's asked me which, what could a portion PQ of the graph, graph represent. Here we go. That's this bit here, where I can see from my labeling, it's liquid cooling, which is on answer C. 17. A student wishes to check the upper and lower fixed points on a Celsius scale thermometer. All right, Celsius scale is defined at two points. Pure water boiling and pure ice melting. So let's see. It's asking us which because we should use. Beaker P contains a mixture of ice and salt. No, we don't want any salt. Beaker Q contains a mixture of ice and water. Ooh, ice and water, melting ice. Beaker R contains boiling salt solution. I think not. And beaker S contains boiling water. So we've got the lower fixed point and the upper fixed point. Which two beakers? Q and S, wherever that is. Here we go. Option D. Two otherwise identical cars, one black and one white, 
are at the same initial temperature. The cars are left in bright sunshine and the temperatures increase. During the night, the temperatures decrease. Which car shows the greatest rate of temperature increase and which car shows the greater rate of temperature decrease? Right. Well, black is the best absorber, but it's also the best emitter. What does that mean? Well, it means during the day, the black car is going to get hotter. And at night time, it's going to get colder faster. There we go. So the answer is A. Question number 19. A liquid is heated in a beaker. The density of the liquid changes as its temperature changes. This causes energy to be transferred through the liquid. How does the density change and what is this energy transfer process? Okay, when we heat something here, the density becomes less. Density decreases. As density decreases, it rises. As it rises, reaches the surface, makes way, starts to cool down, comes around here again, like so. Happens going this way as well. And those are called convection currents. All right, so let's see which one uh, that corresponds to. So density decreases, absolutely, and the process is called convection. Conduction, of course, happens when it's in contact with something else. Convection is when there's a change in density and a large movement of the liquid or the gas. D, sound waves of frequency 2 kilohertz travel through a substance at a speed of 800 meters per second. What is the wavelength of the waves? All right, well, C equals F lambda. So I can put it into my triangle, C, F, lambda. And I want to find the wavelength. So I just cover over the wavelength and I'm left with the equation I need. Wavelength equals C over frequency, speed over frequency, which is then 800 meters per second divided by 2000 hertz, which will give me a value of 0.4 meters, which is answer A. Question 21. Which row shows the nature of light waves, sound waves, and X-rays? All right. So light waves and X-rays are both members of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're both transverse waves, and that means their oscillations are at 90 degrees to the direction of travel, the direction of propagation. Sound waves, on the other hand, they're longitudinal. And that means that their vibration is in the same direction as the direction of travel direction of propagation. All right, so let's see which row corresponds to that. There we are, row C, transverse, longitudinal, transverse. There we go. Next one, question 22. The diagram shows light traveling from air into glass. Four angles, V, W, uh, X and Y are shown. And which formula is used to calculate the refractive index N of the glass. Mm-hmm. So from air into glass. Okay, well, let's see. What we know is N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. And N1 for air equals 1. So if I rearrange that, N2 is sine theta 1 divided by sine of theta 2. So let's see which one that is. Oh, actually, we're dealing with uh, W's, Y's, V's and X's, aren't we? So let's just write that out again. N2 is the sine of W, which is theta 1, theta in. And sine of theta 2 is sine of X. That's because always the angles being measured are from the normal line. There we go. All right, so which one corresponds to that? N equals sine of W over sine of X. And... It's D. There we go. 23. The diagram shows a converging lens forming an, in, an image of an object. Which statement about the image is correct? Right. We see the image is on the same side as the object is. They're both on the left-hand side of the lens. There's the image here. The other one's the object. It's on the same size. It's a larger this is a virtual object, cannot be projected. Okay. So, yep, the eye is located at Y. 
the answer here is D. It's a virtual image and it can be seen by the eye when the eye is located at Y. Question 24. A sound wave travels through the air as a series of compressions and rarefactions. Which row correctly compares the air pressure in a compression and the air pressure in a rarefaction to the air pressure nearby when there is no sound wave? All right. Now, a compression is an area of high pressure and a rarefaction is an area of low pressure. So let's just look at that. Uh, first, air pressure in a compression. Well, it's got to be higher. It's got to be one of the top two. And air pressure in a rarefaction is lower. So the answer is B. 25. A sound wave has a certain amplitude and a certain frequency. A second sound wave is quieter and lower in pitch than the first sound wave. The second sound wave has what do we have? Okay. Let's uh, look at the comparing ampl amplitude and frequency. So let's just examine it. It's quieter, that means the amplitude is going to be smaller. Lower in pitch means the frequency will be smaller. So we're looking for that. And the answer is D. Smaller amplitude and a smaller frequency. 26. What is an electric field? Uh, let's run through the possibilities. A. A region around a wire carrying... Uh, an electric current in which a compass needle experiences a force. Well, here it's talking about a magnetic field, not an electric field. That's not that one. B, a region in which an electric charge experiences a force. Well, that's correct. C, a region in which an electric charge is attracted by the Earth's gravity. No. And D, a region through which electromagnetic radiation is passing. No on that one too. The answer is B. 27. A negatively charged rod is held close to one side of a metal sphere. The other side of the sphere is earthed. Which diagram shows the distribution of charge on the metal sphere? All right, we're bringing up a negatively charged rod. Let's quickly describe what happens. Now, let's say I have a negatively charged rod that I'm bringing up. I've got a situation then where what will happen is all the, if it's a standalone rod, if it's not attached to anything, some negative charges will move to the other side, leaving a positive charge on the side closest to the negative rod. Now, if we take that sphere and we were to attach it down to Earth, well, those electrons don't have to stop there. They can move further away from that force that's repelling them. And you'll get an effect a little bit like that. So let's see which one we're looking for. Ah, the answer here is D. Let's look at 28. Question 28. A cell is connected to a lamp as shown. A charge of four coulombs flows through the lamp in two seconds. What is the direction of the electron flow in the lamp and what is the current in the lamp? Oh, tricky question. And I'll tell you why. Because whenever we deal with conventional current, we tend to draw it from the large end round into the small end. We'd say the current travels in that direction. But that was uh, a couple of hundred years ago. People tried to figure out what was moving. Was it a positive charge or a negative charge? And they guessed positive charge. They were wrong. They guessed backwards. So now we still draw the lines for current that they used then. But that's called conventional current. The direction that the electrons are actually moving is the other direction. So that would be conventional current. And this would be the direction of the electrons. OK, so the electrons are going to be moving in this direction. Through the lamp, that will be traveling from left to right. OK. Now the question next is, what is the current in the lamp? Well, current equals charge over time. Q over T, which is 4.0 coulomb charge in a 2.0 second time period. That's 2.0 amps. And there we go. It's answer A. Question 29. The diagram shows four current voltage graphs. Which two graphs show the characteristic of an ohmic resistor, 
and one of a filament lamp. Okay, so let's look at that. An ohmic resistor, what does that mean? That means it follows V equals I R. It means the resistance is always constant. Which means if you get a voltage current graph, you're going to get a straight line. Now, this would be a straight line coming through 0, 0, which is X. Now, let's just take that, that voltage current graph that we have there under X and see what happens with a filament lamp. With a filament lamp, as the temperature increases, the filament in the lamp gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And when a metal gets hotter, its resistance increases. Which means, see our filament, our uh, graph of X here, let's just see what would happen. It would start off, if it's cold, it would be just like that. As it heats up, it takes more and more voltage to get that extra little bit of current. You can see it's starting to bend over, like so. And it gets to a point where it just takes a lot more voltage to get a little bit more current. And if we look at the possibilities, only one of them has that. And that is the graph at Y. There we are. So they, they are our two graphs. The first graph, which is for a, an ohmic resistor, is X and the second one for a filament lamp is Y. So there we go. The answers, that's B. Question 30. The four circuits shown all include an AC power supply, two diodes and a lamp. In which circuit is there a rectified current in the lamp? Okay, so it's being asked about a rectified current. What does that mean? Well, it means it's either going to be all positive or all negative. It's never going to be positive, then negative, positive, then negative. It, all, it can only be one type. It can be positive, then zero, then positive again, then zero. Or it can be negative, then zero, negative again. But it can't be the opposite. So either always positive or zero, or always negative or zero. So let's look at A. Let's see what happens if the current travels around in this direction. Well, if it travels around in that direction, it's going to keep travelling around. Absolutely fine, no problems at all. What happens if it travels the other direction? Well, it gets to our first diode here and it stops. It can't get any further. Which means if I start off with, say, A, I start off with a graph which looks like that, that is going to become... There we go. It will only allow the current to pass in one direction. So this would of course be voltage, that would be time, same down here. Just to show what's happening. It only allows the current to pass in one direction. Let's look at B. So A is a possibility, certainly. Let's look at B. If a current is travelling in this direction, what happens? Well, it can travel around here. I'm travelling this way, by the way. It can travel around here, it gets up to this bit. It can't go to the left, but it can go to the right. So no problems, it can travel that way. If it's travelling in the other direction, well, I can go off to the left this time and come round. So B, the current can go in both directions. No. C, let's see what happens. If the current's travelling this way, it gets to the first diode and it can't go past it. If it's travelling the other way, it gets to the first diode and can't go past it. So it's not C. C is always going to be zero current. In D, there we go. It goes this direction, it can pass that one and it stops at the second one. If it's going the other direction, comes around this way, comes around this way, and stops at the second one. So D is also out. The only one that will give a rectified current is A. Right, 31. It's quite a tricky little question, this one. Pretty hard. We can get it done, though. We're going to do it. We're going to do it well. The diagram shows a combination of logic gates. Input P is at logic state 0 and input Q is at logic state 1. What are the logic states at output X and output Y? Okay, that's not too bad. This They've given the specific inputs coming in there. Okay, so let's look at P. As P travels through our NOT gate, it's going to become the opposite. So if it goes in as a 0, it's going to come out as a 1. And input Q is 1. And that's there. It's also a 1 over here. Okay, now let's just look at what this is. This here is a NAND gate. 
It's like if I take an AND key and then do the opposite. Then I'll show you what I mean. If I have an AND key, it will give me a 1 as an output if both of the inputs are 1. So if I have the inputs A and B, and that's 1, and that's 1, and AND gate would give me a 1. And an AND gate would give me a 0, because it's just going to do the opposite of an AND gate. So that tells me both the inputs are high, it's an AND gate, coming out here will be 0. Which means the output x will be 0. This also gets fed in here to our NOR gate. Now, a NOR gate of course is just an OR gate with a NOT gate after it. So it does the opposite of an OR gate. It's terrible though, because you have to leave this uh, this gap. I'm describing I'm describing a nor gate, not an or gate. Hmm, silly. All right, so inputs a and b. Just what would happen if input a and b? If we get a zero and a one, an or gate would give us a one because if a or b or both are high, you get high output. So it's uh, if either of, either or both of them are one, you get one as the output. Oops, not a not gate, a nor gate. Okay, so the opposite of that one would be a zero. So my two outputs there, zero and zero, which is option A. 32. The diagram shows part of a circuit used to switch street lamps on and off automatically. Here we've got an LDR, and what happens as the light goes down, the resistance goes up. Oh, in the evening it gets dark. Which row shows the effect of the resistance on of the LDR, well, we just went through that as it gets dark, the resistance goes up, and on the potential difference across it. Okay, so the resistance of the LDR will increase. So it's one of those two options. The potential difference across the LDR, well, our voltage across our resistor, R1, is equal to R1 divided by R1 plus R2 multiplied by the supply voltage. As resistance 1 gets bigger, the voltage across resistance 1 also gets bigger. So there we go. Potential difference across the LDR also increases the answer is D. 33. A domestic circuit includes a 30 amp fuse. This protects the wiring if there is too much current in the circuit. In which wire is the 30 amp fuse positioned and what does it do when it operates? Okay, 30 amp fuse should always be in a live wire and the reason is it disconnects the circuit and you want it to be disconnected as fast as possible. You don't want this entire section of wire running through your house that's alive if the circuit's broken. So you want it to cut out as early as possible. That's why the fuses, a lot of them end up in the plugs. There we go. So it disconnects the circuit and that's A. 34. A strong electromagnet is used to attract pins. What happens when the current in the coil is halved? A. No pins are attracted. Well, it might still have some magnetism. B. Some pins are attracted, but not as many. Yeah, that would happen. C. The same number of pins are attracted. No because there's less current, less magnetism, less magnetic field. And D, more pins are attracted. No, that's the opposite of it. Okay, so the answer is B. 35. The diagram shows a transformer. The input voltage is uh, 240 volts. What is the output voltage? We've given the primary coils, uh, the tons of the primary coil and tons on the secondary coil. All right, not as hard as it first appears because we know our equations. There we are, and we're being asked to find the output voltage, Vs. That's going to be equal to Ns over Np times Vp, Vp. Which will give me 40 divided by 800 multiplied by uh, 240. Which is in fact 12 volts is our answer, so B. 36. The diagram shows a shaded area where the direction of the magnetic field is into the page. 
a beam of beta particles into the field as shown. In which direction is the beam of beta particles deflected as they enter the magnetic field? Oh, mm -hmm. this is a tricky question. See, for this you need to use Fleming's left hand rule. And of course your first finger is the direction of the field. Your second finger, your middle finger, is in the direction of the flow of conventional current and the thumb gives you a direction of force on the particle. But of course, and just a little reminder here, if the beta particles go this way, these are electrons, which means conventional current travels in that direction. So if you use your left hand rule, first finger pointing into the page, the middle finger, the second finger pointing to the left, then your thumb will point downwards. And that tells you the direction of force experienced by our beta particles. Just to be clear, that should be a nice smooth curve. It's clearly not in this case. <laughs> it's getting worse. Point being, it's C down the page. 37. The arrangement shown, uh, shown is used to check whether the flower inside a cardboard packet is above a certain level. If it's above this level, the flower absorbs radiation from the source so that it doesn't reach the detector. Ooh, which type of radiation is suitable for use? All right, if you want it to be absorbed by the flower, then it would have to be beta radiation. Because alpha radiation would be absorbed by the packet, it would stop here. It would never get any further. And uh, stop too soon. And gamma radiation just wouldn't stop. There's not enough mass in front of it. Most of the gamma radiation goes straight through. It wouldn't make any difference, really. So the most effective one to use there is beta particles, only beta particles, because alpha particles are pointless and gamma rays are far too strong. 38. A nucleus of americium emits an alpha particle to form a nucleus of neptunium. Which equation represents this decay? All right, let's look at that. We've got 2, 4, 3, and 95. And that's americium. And that's going to change into our alpha particle, which is four nucleons and two protons, two positive charges. And that's plus neptunium. Now, wherever these numbers are, for the bottom of neptunium and top of neptunium, let's look at the bottom first. If I add two to the number, I have to get 95, so it must be 93. And if I add four to the number, I have to get 243, so it must be 239. So let's see which equation represents that. 239 and 93. Uh, this one at the bottom. There we go. D. All of the other ones. Well, that's not enough particles. It's a beta. That's a beta. And here it's been added together. No, that's just wrong. 39. A certain element has several isotopes. Which statement about these isotopes is correct? Well, let's be clear before we, we even jump into this. For an isotope, it will have the same number of protons. Protons are the same. Different uh, neutrons. And unless it's been ionized, you'd expect it to have the same number of electrons uh, in, the, in the outer shells. because it's got the same number of protons and the electrons are there because they're attracted to the protons. All right, so let's see what we have. Um, A, they must have different numbers of electrons. Nope, they mustn't. Well, they could, but they don't have to. They'd be an ion if they did. B, they must have the same number of neutrons in a nuclei. That's the opposite of the truth. C, they must have the same number of nucleons in a nuclei. Different number of neutrons will give you a different number of nucleons. D, they must have the same number of protons in their nuclei. There we go. The answer is D. And finally, number 40, a reading is taken every 10 minutes of the number of emissions per second for a radioactive source. The table shows the readings. What is the half-life of the source? Well, let's have a look. If I start off with 800 readings per second, 800 emissions per second, then by the time it hits 400, that should be one half-life. And that should be the same as the length of time it takes to get to 200, because that's another half-life. And that should be the same as the length of time it gets to 100, because that's another half-life. Each one of those is a half-life because it drops by half. 800 to 400, 400 to 200, 200 to 100. 
If there were different numbers, then we'd take an average. We'd expect them to be pretty similar, though. All right, so what is the half-life of the source? If I jump over to the minutes, 20 minutes, still 20 minutes, and it looks to me like it's 20 minutes. I'm going to go for option B, 20 minutes. And there we are. Hopefully you've enjoyed that, and that's been nice and helpful. Um, if you liked it, then feel free to like and subscribe. And if you have any uh, comments, anything that you'd like me to cover, just feel free to leave it in the comment. Otherwise, you know, have a lovely day.